appreciate you coming tonight. I um, had the opportunity to talk about something I'm very passionate about, which is shoulder, shoulder conditions. And there are some familiar faces, some unfamiliar faces. So I think as those who know me, but then those who will learn me, you know, the way I'm going to talk to you tonight is how I talk to you in the office. You know, I think it's real important as we go through these topics that I try to put it at a level that we all can understand. You know, obviously there's some technical terms I'm going to talk about things, but I want to, when you leave here at least to say, hey, A, I, I understand what this, what the shoulder really is. B, if I'm having a condition, I can at least get a better feel for it. I mean, there's a broad range that we're going to discuss. I'm not going to try to, you know, make you experts, but at least if you leave here tonight, better knowledge of what's going on, or at least some questions you can, you can ask, or maybe an opportunity to come and see one of us in our office to help you. That's kind of the goals for today. So, whoops, we've got to get used to the trigger. So just kind of the basic overview of what we're going to do today, our objectives. As I mentioned, I'm going to kind of start out, don't worry, there's no test at the end, but I want to review some anatomy. I've got a former professor or teacher over there, there's no test at the end, okay, just understand. But at least if you leave here understanding terms, I know there's a lot of uh, resources out there, but if you can everybody understand, what is a rotator cuff? What, is, what are we talking about? I think that's important. We'll discuss how do we figure it out? How do we as physicians or clinicians figure out what your problem is? You know, a big section of this, and I kind of put it in the middle, and I've added this in talks in different, you know, times. I mean, we're not going to necessarily, most of us aren't necessarily coming to my office uh, to have me fix your torn rotator cuff tendon. A lot of the stuff we're going to talk about is I've been working in the yard or, work, or at work, I've got a pain, I've got a problem, why is it there? Maybe reviewing some of the risk factors and ways to prevent a problem. I certainly will get into more details on common conditions and we'll talk about really treatment options so at least you understand if I have this problem, what am I up against, non-surgical or surgical? So to keep it simple, we're going to talk about the bones, we're going to talk about the joints. And really the, the bones as I described them to you in these diagrams on, the, on your upper right, you have an upper arm bone in the body called the humerus. At the very top there's a round part of that called the humeral head. You have a shoulder blade or scapula. And then there's a clavicle. So those really are the basic things we're going to talk about. When we talk about the joints, there's two joints. There's a ball and a socket. So on this upper diagram right here, the ball and socket joint, humeral head, and then there's a fancy term for the socket called the glenoid just remember socket. And just in terms of what does that joint re relate to, I'll use football for example. If you hear about a shoulder dislocation, that's actually the ball coming out of the socket. Now the other joint we'll talk about, whoops, some wrong button there, get used to it. So where the collarbone meets the shoulder blade, there's a process at the top of the shoulder, and we'll get into this more detail because it is relevance to pain. I call it the roof bone of the shoulder, it's called the acromion process. And like I say, further diagrams to explain things. But where that collarbone meets the shoulder blade, if you've heard the term shoulder separation, that's when a player would injure that joint, just to kind of give you some reference points. Oops, I think it went, uh, there we go. So, muscles. So, just to understand how complex the shoulder is, there are 18 muscles that originate or attach on the shoulder blade. That's how complex it is for you to move your arm in relationship to your body. We're going to keep it simple. We're going to talk about two major tendon groups. One, something referred to as the rotator cuff, which is kind of represented on this diagram by kind of the white here. So these are the different muscles. And there are four total muscles, front, top, and back. And then the other muscle, which actually more so a tendon that we're going to talk about, is your biceps. Your biceps muscle in your arm actually has a tendon that attaches deep inside the shoulder. So these will become terms that we'll utilize through the, through the discussion. When we talk about the anatomy, the, in every, every joint we have has cartilage, a cushion. And really the terms in the shoulder joint, there's the cartilage on the end of the bone, like a chicken drumstick has that white rubbery cap or treads on a tire. And that's represented by what you're seeing here, kind of this off-white smooth structure. And then the other unique cartilage inside our shoulder, if you look at the socket, along the, around the edge of the socket is something called the labrum. So we're seeing a little bit of it here. This is another picture of the labrum. Think about the labrum, it's an attachment point for muscles, it's an attachment point for the lining of the joint or the capsule that I've referenced. It's also like a bumper. So if you think about it, if you have, you're working on your car, you put some blocks under the tires to keep it from rolling, it has a role in stability of the shoulder. And we'll talk more about that. And then last I mentioned the capsule or the lining of the joint. So within that capsule, what keeps your shoulder in place are ligaments. Ligaments connect bone to bone. And some of these will be referenced further in the talk. Now the last concept, okay, let me see, we got bones, we got muscles, we got tendons, we got all the things we've discussed. Well, between the muscles and between the bones, and in particular in our shoulder, I mentioned that roof bone, the top bone in the shoulder, called the acromion. 
And what this diagram has, it shows this blue area. So people have probably heard the term bursa before. Simply what a bursa is, it's a fluid-filled sac inside our body or around our body. Anywhere where two surfaces move together, it lubricates that. And we have a big bursa sitting right here in our shoulder between that roof bone called the acromion and your rotator cuff tendon. So it's referred to as the subacromial bursa. And that'll become relevant as I start talking about, hey, why does it hurt when I raise my arm darker? Why is my arm causing pain at night? We're gonna talk about bursitis and a condition called impingement. So if somebody presents to my office and they're having a problem with their shoulder, well, how do we figure out what's wrong, okay? On the left is the column, history. I can tell I, in 90% of the time, if a patient comes in and they're, very, and they're a good historian, they can kind of give me the details as to what's going on, how long it's been going on. Obviously, most patients are having pain. Many patients have some alterations in strength or function, stiffness, some note popping or catching. You know, we want to know, did this happen when you slipped and fell on the ice and you couldn't raise your arm? Or, no, it's been there for about three years and I just started to, you know, getting worse. I wanted to come in and see you. You know, have you had any treatment? Because usually once we get through that portion of the discussion, I probably know 90% of the time what the problem is, okay? Or I have it down to one or two different things because it's just a lot of the stuff, common things are common. Well, obviously we listen to our patients. We want to hear what they're telling us. We want to know what they've had done previously. But then there's the exam, laying hands on a patient, being able to see how they can move the arm. Where does it hurt? You know, and that's where that anatomy in my mind is very critical. If I push on the very top where the collarbone meets the shoulder blade and it's painful, likely they're gonna have some sort of arthritis of that joint. So just things that as we're trying to equate what we've been told, what do we see? Well, we look at all these things. Motion, where does it hurt? Is there any weakness in these muscle groups around the shoulder? And then with the shoulder, there's all sorts of little different tests. So if you've ever been examined and someone's taking the arm or, or we're rotating, all these are trying to reproduce, hey, is that pain coming from rotator cuff tendon? Hey, is that pain coming from that space called the bursa? Could that pain be coming from the neck or a referred pain? So all this stuff ties together so we can figure out, hey, what's the problem? So if you have your history and your physical exam, we've really honed it down, if not knowing for sure, being pretty close as to what the problem is. Well, as you know, part of any diagnostic evaluation, if you come to see us in orthopedics, will be an x-ray. An x-ray is a way for us to see the bone and see the joints. I mean, it is kind of the, the, the workhorse because there's so much we can learn by just an x-ray. So the pictures you're seeing here, this is a left shoulder. Here's the picture of the upper ball or humeral head. Here's the socket. This happens to be a view like you would stand and face us. This is a view as if you're kind of looking up through the armpit, but it's just another way to see where the ball and socket line up. And then this is a picture if you're looking at the shoulder from the side, and I don't know what it shows in the back, but we have that upper roof bone called the acromion. The ball is here and that space is right where I'm kind of showing you now. I mean, what are we looking for? We're looking for the shape of the bone. We're looking for the relationship. Are the bones well lined up? Are they misaligned? There are changes on an x-ray that I'll talk about later that are characteristic for osteoarthritis. You know, certainly in the face of an injury, slip and fall, I mean, we're looking for potential fractures or other more significant things. But then part of life and time, as you're well aware in this room, and I'm aware as well, our body ages and there's some subtle changes, bone spurs and otherwise, that start to form around the shoulder that may be contributing to why someone has pain. Something that's growing in popularity, popularity just means it's becoming more accessible to us clinicians, and maybe some of you in the office have been to a clinic where they've used this, is something called ultrasound. So x-rays show us the bony structures. We can infer what the soft tissues, the muscles and tendons look like, but we can't see them. Ultrasound is a neat tool where by using this device, we can actually start to see the tendons, the muscles. The neat thing about it, it's an in-office procedure. We don't have to send you to the hospital or to a center to get it done. It's an excellent screening tool. As I mentioned, it's becoming more widely utilized. A lot of it is each of us as physicians finding the, you know, the time and the place to apply this. You know, good news if someone does an ultrasound, hey, let me put the ultrasound to look and see. Do you have a tendon tear? Do you have a bone spur? Do you have something like that? You know, it's a pretty quick tool. It's less expensive than having an MRI. Now, it doesn't show us everything, but it's a very good screening tool. Now, certainly it's user experience and technology dependent, you know, better technology, better experience. But I think this is something that's going to be more prevalent as we go forward in the 2020s than we did probably in the 20 teens. Now, once again, from the back row, I mean, it's kind of hard to see, but what we're showing you, this is just a snapshot where the ultrasound would be coming down from the top, and they've labeled, this is the muscle, the deltoid, which is under the skin. This is someone's rotator cuff tendon, which can be seen very nicely, and then below that's the bone. And then based on characteristics, we can determine, is that normal? Is there inflammation? Is there a tear? 
And the other thing I didn't put in this slide, which is something I think is going to be very valuable, you can move an arm with an ultrasound. You can do things that we call our dynamic. Let's say someone says, I've got a snapping sensation and we put the ultrasound and we're moving that shoulder, we can be watching, maybe we can see, is it their biceps tendonage or something else? So I put this in here, it wasn't in the last talk I gave, because I think it's something that's gonna be, in, you know, for us as clinicians and then you as patients experiencing it, a tool that'll be more widely used. If someone's coming in though and they have problems, we've, you know, we've, we're, we're worried about an injury to muscle, tendon, even bone, I mean the gold standard test and whether you're talking your, your shoulder, your hip, your knee, your spine, ultimately is an MRI, because with an MRI you see everything, okay? You can see it all, in other words. We can determine what does the rotator cuff look like, the labrum, the cartilage. You know, uh, when we do this test, and it depends on the, what the suspicion is, it depends on the age of the patient. You know, an MRI, if those have had it, you slide in the tube, you slide out, and then we can generate these beautiful images. There's a procedure called an arthrogram. So arthrogram simply means inject eye into a shoulder or inject eye into a joint. So when I tell patients I want them to have an arthrogram, it's because all these structures are tightly packed and I'm looking for subtle things, a cartilage tear, maybe a partial tear of a tendon. So what you're seeing on this particular diagram, that white you see here, that's actual dye, but notice how that really st sets apart these different structures. Here's rotator cuff tendon. This is the ball of the shoulder. I mentioned the term labrum, that ring-like structure that goes around. Well, that's the labrum in cross-section. And it really helps us to have a greater sensitivity, which is if it's there, we find it. And the other term for, uh, for a statistician is specificity. If it's not there, we know it's not there. So really, if we're kind of trying to hone in and say, is there something bad? Is there something we're gonna need to fix or repair? You'll usually have an MRI for us to help understand that. So let's kind of get into well, what causes shoulder pain. I mean, that's a big topic, but you know, Common things are common, and most times, and most of you can attest to this, whether it's because you've been shoveling, raking, or working, you know, most times it's something, oops, pardon, most times it's due to something rep you know, repetitive. And the most times when patients come in and say, I'm having problems, whether it's your shoulder or what it may be, it's not necessarily due to a specific injury. Now that does happen, but that's much less common. So we're talking about some sort of repetitive overuse causing inflammation, or as I say at the itis, but itis at the end of the word, it just means it's inflamed. So it's arthritis means joint inflammation, myositis means muscle inflammation, and you can see going all the way down. But that's usually, it's something where I was working on a project, I had a job at work, you name it, something that was repetitively stressing the joint or the joint area causing pain. This is where I kind of stuck in, all right, if we're talking about most of these conditions are related to repetitive or overuse, what are those risk factors that might put you as an individual at risk that might in that environment cause pain what are the, some of these things that might cause prevention? So before I get into the details of what's a rotator cuff tear and otherwise, I'll put some of these things out there because the old, the old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Many of the things that people come in with, good news, turn out to be things that we can address. They don't need a surgery. And even then, if I can educate them, okay, this is why it came on. Here's how you can prevent it in the future. It probably affords them the opportunity to control what they're doing so they don't have to come back and see me. So obviously they're human factors. We're all different. We're all different biologically, size, shape, and otherwise. So obviously when we start doing a task, our, our endurance, our conditioning, who knows where, you know, we just got up and went and did something versus we're warmed up. So a lot of stuff can be avoided just through making sure before you can, you'll go into a repetitive task, you have an opportunity to warm up. I mean, everyone, as I mentioned, is different from a fitness standpoint, a health standpoint, and otherwise. So our tolerances, both just endurance, but our tissue quality, tissue healing is different. So the human factors are big when it comes to some of these repetitive overuse conditions. Ergonomics, or just how I do something, whether that's work or at home, obviously have a big role in this. Posture, positioning, hey, how am I doing this? I have to apply a force in an awkward position. Unfortunately, it puts stress to a joint or puts a joint at risk. You know, it's not how heavy so much, it's sometimes how repetitive. You know, someone who has to do this activity all day long, you know, unfortunately that can build up over time. You know, direct pressure like leaning, and you know, I, I have the jackhammer here, but I mean, obviously not many of you are doing that, but just vibrations, other things have a role. So when it comes to awkward posture, and we're gonna talk about a condition where we said already, kind of this pinching in the shoulder. You know, when we're doing activities at this position, first of all, it puts the shoulder at a mechanical disadvantage but it also narrows and tightens some of those spaces. So you can see where over time, hey, it's starting to hurt. 
And obviously just simple things like, you know, bring the project down to you or bring you up to the project. Don't force something where you're working in an awkward position can go a long way to reducing the chance for some of these overuse issues. You know, the whole posture and how we lift, you know, once again, lifting high or lifting low, whether that's the shoulder or upper back or the lower back or your knees, anything that can be done more in a neutral position can obviously be safer for you. You know, even just how we sit, I think everybody in this room either said it or had it said to them, sit up straight, okay? And that's my comment. I'm sure your mom or your dad or somebody, and I've said it to my kids, and I'm not always the best example when I'm sitting in the office all hunched over, but as we'll talk in a moment, that has a bearing on the positioning of the shoulder, the muscles in the shoulder, once again, this space that can create impingement. So we'll, certainly as we talk about avoidance or treatment, hey, how can we open up and make sure that the spaces and the muscles in the shoulder have the best mechanical advantage so we're not creating trauma, injury, or pain? You know, some of the force and repetitive pressure, I mean, that, that does apply to the shoulder. That's probably less at home, but still, if you're working with a tool or working with something that's creating some jarring to the joint, the muscles are trying to stabilize it, but with that repetitive stress, once again, it can build up inflammation and irritation of the tissue. So this is a concept, you know, I have a patient come in and they say, well, doctor, it hurts. When does it hurt? It hurts when I go this way. So the simple answer is don't go this way, okay? Well, it is true for that because what I'm trying to demonstrate in this diagram on the right is like a bird's eye view looking down on a person. So if you raise your arms up, it's very easy to do that. It's very easy. If you raise your arms straight out, it doesn't go very high. And there's a reason for that. The shoulder blade doesn't sit parallel to your back. The shoulder blade is tilted forward about 40 degrees. And so this concept of, well, if I'm going straight up and down, well, that's great because the shoulder blade gets out of the way. You're less likely to pinch or aggravate the shoulder. If you go out to the side, here's your shoulder blade, but now your arm is, is kind of in extension and you're actually creating a, a bad mechanical environment. You're pinching the tissues, the muscles aren't strong. So as I'm working through and we're rehabbing or recovering, I try to educate the patient to say, you know, if it's something in front of you, that's great. Don't try to lift something or grab something up here. Turn your body, keep it in this plane. Once again, as another way to avoid creating that, you know, stress and strain on the joint. Certainly this applies with work. It applies to those, hey, I am working out, doctor. What do you mean? I'm taking those weights, I'm going. So as I try to work through, and this is, you know, in all ages, of course, but, you know, some are more rigorous than others where they insist they got to get back and do this certain workout. I just try to educate them on safer things. You know, I tell people, see your hands. If you can't see your hands, you're probably not lifting or doing things right. Why? Because if you can't see your hands, you're usually doing something where you're putting in that shoulder in an awkward position. You know, you know, I tell patients, if you're a shoulder problem person, your shoulder is better. If you're gonna bench, don't let your chest touch the ground or the dumbbell touch or, your, or the bar touch your chest. Once again, it's just putting that shoulder in better position so you're less likely to stretch, strain, pinch, pull, or cause pain. So these are all things that once somebody understands it, it makes sense. Or if they've been through a painful condition, they don't wanna have that happen again. If we can make these modifications, they're less likely to have problems in the future. Certainly if somebody has had an injury to the shoulder, you know, and, and part of the education is, well, I mentioned there are 18 muscles, and some of those you see in the mirror, and some of those you don't, those deep muscles. And if we can have through either a therapist or whatever education, teach patients that if you're gonna stay fit and you're gonna do a repetitive, you know, whether that's recreational, whether that's, you know, work, you're gonna do something repetitive that stresses your shoulder, the stronger we keep the small muscles, the rotator cuff muscles, the better off you're gonna be. Because most times when you're in the weight room or you're working out, you're working the muscles you can see in the mirror, you're not necessarily working out those small muscles and it's real important to have balance. And so that's all part of the A, what's the prevention, you know, what are the risk factors, but then if we're working through a condition, we're trying to educate our patients, these are ways to prevent this from becoming worse or coming back. So having said all that, okay, there's my public service announcement. Let's kind of get into kind of specifics and we'll start very simple. So the majority of people, you know, and they may not even come in and see us, but you know, out in the yard, first time, you know, shoveling snow for the year. Hey, we had to go out, we had to rake the yard. Something I'm using as examples where, you know, you haven't done it in a while. Well, you're gonna be sore afterwards. I mean, most times it's just a little muscle strain, myofascial strain, uh, you know, the myositis, usually not associated with, I felt a pop or it was so bad I had to stop. You know, typically these are self-limiting conditions. Hey, I, I took some ibuprofen, I put the ice bag or the heating pad on it. Good news, I didn't have to go back and do it the next day. It slowly, steadily gets better. Now, that being said, you know, there are some warning signs, you know, that might be not just muscle, it could be more. And those are things where you have sim you know, symptoms persisting, okay? It's not getting better. I've really been avoiding it, you know, that type of thing. 
you know, I feel I've lost movement, I've lost strength. It's something mechanical. Hey, it's popping, it's catching. Certainly in those settings, it's time to have it looked at by somebody clinician-wise. And I, I should say before I keep going forward, understand that I'll, I'll kind of break these out into, you know, like individual little groups, but a lot of these things overlap. You know, someone's gonna have muscle pain if they also have a rotator cuff tear. Someone's gonna have, you know, so these things I'm kind of isolating, but a lot of this, is, it's a mixture when they finally come in and see us. So here's that impingement or that, you know, that comment. So this is a diagram on your right. What we're kind of tr trying to show with this is that this is the shoulder, there's the roof bone of the shoulder. This person is going straight out to the side and what they're doing is pinching that tendon into the bone or pinching the bursa. So it's a very common condition because once again, we're always doing repetitive things. As I mentioned, due to shape of the bone, posture, otherwise it can cause a repetitive stress and strain. Unfortunately, as we get older, I mentioned we look for bone spurs. That's one of those areas where oftentimes you'll have a little spur that makes the space a little narrower to start with or increases one's risk. You know, oftentimes it's associated with that shoulder blade, you know, rolling forward versus staying back. You know, and oftentimes it can be associated with, you know, with lifting and carrying the collarbone or clavicle, it's a strut. And where those two bones come together, it can start to grow some bone spurs. And those bone spurs, people can feel it up. Hey, look at this bump on the top of my shoulder. Well, that could be a little spur going up but there's also one going down that could be rubbing and pinching as well. So as we're trying to, you know, what's the, what's the classic symptoms? Well, it's pain, well, of course. Often worse with elevation or rotation. Hey, I turn it a certain way, it hurts. I turn it another way, it doesn't hurt because it just depends on where the inflamed portion is coming in contact. Now, when it gets bad enough, you know, activity pain, but then it can start to hurt at rest. Well, doctor, it hurts right here. It doesn't hurt here, doctor, it hurts right here. Well, I try to explain to patients that the pain kind of pattern where people can have pain that could be shoulder is anywhere from the top of the shoulder down the side of the arm because there are nerves inside the shoulder that also supply sensation to the outer arm. So the analogy would be if someone's having a heart attack where they may not be feeling it in their chest but they can feel it in their neck and their arm, there's this referred pattern of pain. And that can be differentiated because there's certain things we do with an exam that can lead us to where the problem is. Once again, if it starts to hurt, people compensate, you may lose motion, you may lose strength. And it kind of is a vicious cycle. You know, we, we are, you know, we're human beings. We just keep going no matter what. But we start to compensate. We start to do things differently. And that can perpetuate it getting worse. Well, what's the treatment? And the good news, the story, if someone really has classic impingement, you know, repetitive use over time, probably at least 85 to 90% of the time, if caught early, it's not been on again, off again for 20 years because you worry then there might be some more damage. You know, it's usually, you know, something that's self-limited or corrected through some reasonable therapy. Do something to manage inflammation, whether that's oral medications. You know, get people, you know, their pain under control and then work on correcting some of the dysfunction around the shoulder so it moves better. The, the space that's being pinched is, is no longer being pinched. There may be a role for injection. Doc, just give me a cortisone shot. And, and many people have had that. You may get an injection in the bursa if it's deemed indicated to help reduce that inflammation or pain. It's not the only thing one should do, because if you get a shot, it's better for a while it'll come back. But if it's done in, in conjunction with, hey, I've learned the right exercises and how to get my shoulder better, it's likely to be a lasting benefit. As I mentioned, oops, sorry, as I mentioned, up to 90% probably will see improvement if it's just related to inflammation of the bursa, inflammation of the tendon, and we're not dealing with something more serious like a tear. Now, I, don't, I tell patients it's rare that we'll operate on this condition only. But if somebody truly has done all the right things, we've had some benefit and they've probably have been through therapy, tried medicines, had an injection, we're better for a while and it just keeps coming back, then there may be an opportunity to do something about it because it must mean that, that the space itself is started to narrow, probably secondary to bone spurs that can grow, secondary to the bursa becoming more thicker and plain. So if we're talking about, well, how do we manage that? Let's say someone's failed conservative treatment. Well, the gold standard in 2020, it's been now for many years, is what we call shoulder arthroscopy. So the, the picture on the right is just a, a setup. The patient's underneath the drape. You can't see them. They're asleep. You know, we have the patient with the arm draped out. This is the surgeon, and we're preparing to do that procedure. You know, the neat thing about arthroscopic surgery, and as I mentioned, many of these conditions aren't just isolated. There might be, hey, they have impingement, maybe they have a, you know, they have a rotator cuff tear or otherwise. It allows us to see everything. And as good as ultrasound, as good as MRI and some of these studies are, really the best way to know eventually if it's not getting better is for us to be able to visual, visualize it, see it, understand it better. And kind of the role of what we're doing in surgery, we're trying to make the space between the tendon and bone wider. So we can remove bone spurs, we can clean up the bursa. 
So this first picture, and to try to explain this, we're looking in the shoulder, we're in that space between that roof bone called the acromion, or the bursal space. The picture on the right shows this kind of light blue line. So I didn't, I purposely took a picture where you can't see the bone, you're seeing the soft tissue on top of it, but it's all fuzzy, it's all frayed. We know that's been pinching and rubbing. The rotator cuff would be down here. And that's kind of the slope. There's a big hook if you looked at that from the side. The picture on the right is after, you know, before that hook would carry all the way down. This is after we removed it. Essentially, we made the space bigger. Now, someone may be saying, what the heck is that? So arthroscopic surgery, what we do is we inflate joints with salt water or saline. And for us to work inside the shoulder, we use these little tubes called cannulas so we can get in and out of the joint. It doesn't allow the fluid to leave. It makes it safer for the tissue. So what you're seeing is just one of those little tubes or cannulas. But if this, before that spur hung down all the way to here, you can see how nice and flat it is. So at least we've opened up that space to reduce the impingement. I think the next picture is a picture of somebody that along with that also had some arthritis where the collarbone met the shoulder blade. So this picture on the right, that's your end of your collarbone showing you know, looking straight out at us. Now usually we're not doing that if they didn't have any pain, but if they had additional pain where that collarbone met the shoulder blade, we can remove about a centimeter of that bone. So before the two bones are pinching and rubbing and it hurts, afterwards there's no more pressure and it alleviates that pain. What's the recovery? So if it's just get in, clean it up, remove the bone spurs, get out, nothing needs to be repaired, no stitches, nothing like that. You know, patients are in a sling for a day or two and as soon as they're comfortable, it comes out. We don't have to limit movement other than kind of controlling pain and allowing them to start motion. Those that have a job, hey, can I go back to work? You know, usually, hey, if you're off your pain pills, you're comfortable, you can be back in more of a sedentary job very quickly. Obviously, we want to gradually progress with range of motion and strength. You know, somebody that's in a more repetitive or, or, or a overhead type job, you know, we're probably looking at, a, you know, a couple, three months to get you back at 100%, but most people, excuse me, within about you know, two to three months are back doing everything after that surgery. And all that during that rehab, we're working on rotator cuff, teaching them all the things I kind of talked about on the front end that we try to do to prevent it. Well, if we can teach them how to prevent it from coming back type of thing, that's part of the rehab afterwards. I mentioned biceps tendon, I mentioned labrum. I kind of put this in between. Once again, this is, you know, it's rare that these are isolated, but you know, what happens if someone has problems with their biceps tendon? So the biceps tendon, as I mentioned, it attaches deep inside the shoulder. So this is the socket. Here's your biceps tendon coming to attach, and that's the upper part of what's called the labrum. Now this happens to be a normal biceps, but the majority of patients, once we get older, we're going in for other reasons, there's probably some fraying or tearing. And if someone truly has, hey, this is a pain due to problems with the biceps, tendonitis, a partial tear, sometimes that biceps due to an injury, it has a natural little groove that it runs in, but now it's not in that groove, it's unstable, and it's causing problems, we have two choices. There's the camp that likes to save the biceps, and there's a camp that says cut it and let it fly. And I'll explain pros and cons. I, I reside in the upper camp. I'm a repairer. I'm a, what we call a biceps tenodesis. So what does that really mean? And this, this illustration below is just an example. Normally the biceps attaches here, so they've shown you this little stump, so we release the biceps, and what this diagram would represent, maybe this part was very diseased or unhealthy. I mean, it looks like a rope fraying, almost ready to split, okay? And what they're showing is that they've released it, but then they'll come back and we'll reattach it. So you maintain the attachment point, you get rid of the diseased part, you prevent it from popping and snapping. The advantages of repairing it is that it improves the cosmesis, the muscle. So if someone's ever had a rupture of their biceps, I'm talking at the shoulder, without any other injury, what happens, the biceps retracts and there's a term Popeye. So everybody in the room probably remembers Popeye, or that bulbous muscle. Well, that'll occur if that biceps ruptures spontaneously. Now, it's cosmetic, so understand, some tolerate it, some don't. But muscles are designed to work. They have a certain length, so they can generate a certain tension. And if you alter that too much, it will affect the muscle, and that's where people may have some cramping and problems if that muscle were to rupture. So that's why I'm a believer in the techniques allow me to take care of the biceps very efficiently, alleviate the pain from it, but then maintain the cosmesis. Well, then there's this release it, tenotomy. So I always have to tell my Brett Favre story about tenotomy. So not a good story, because this is the, the spring before he joined the Vikings and darn near took him to the Super Bowl. But, you know, he ended up having a shoulder surgery. Many people didn't know that because he was having pain. And it turned out he had a partial biceps tear and a small, either partial or small rotator cuff tear. And he's thinking, you know, I can sit in rehab for three or four months or I got to be ready for August. I'm going to training camp with the, with the Vikings. He had a tenotomy. So understand, it's not as if it happens, you're, you're not going to be able to function. He went on a throw for 4,000 yards. 
but just realize it's just one of those things where we have options to alleviate biceps pain or biceps problem. Next, kind of talking a little bit about the labrum. So once again, the labrum itself, that cartilage, that ring that goes around it, really the majority of the time that someone injures the labrum, I'm talking a true injury, I mean, these are, these are traumatic injuries. This is my football or other athlete dislocating. Someone slips on the ice, the shoulder comes out. When the shoulder dislocates or come out, comes out of the socket, you can tear the labrum, you can tear the lining of the joint, you can fracture bone. Well, the labrum's there for a reason. So if somebody has a labral tear, and this upper picture shows this is the upper labrum and it's all red and inflamed and pretty shaggy. You know, it's pulled off, of the, pulled off of the socket. Well, that has a bearing on where the biceps attaches, but also has a bearing on stability of the joint. So in a younger, and I won't put an age on it, but just understand younger, traumatic injury where we're concerned. Maybe the injury led to, was because of instability, the joint came out, or we're worried it'll lead to ongoing instability. Then this is an old picture, but this is just showing a repair with these little kind of bluish kind of structures. We're reattaching that back to bone. But once again, those are, you know, it's actually fewer now than we probably did initially because we realize we have to be selective. Not every labor repair is needed and not every labor repair does well. So it's, you know, a fresh injury, a younger relative patient, healthy otherwise, cartilage, but we know it's going to cause instability. The vast majority of times I'm going into a shoulder to do a scope, they're 55 years old, they have a torn rotator cuff. Well, guess what? The labrum's gonna probably look a little shaggy. I mean, it's just part of the wear and tear. Most times what we're doing is just smoothing and shaping it, provided it's not detached and it's not gonna cause instability. It's more about cleaning it up so it doesn't cause mechanical symptoms. And we use the term more degenerative tears. But once again, the whole point is arthroscopically, we can address these problems. Well, let's get to the big one, okay? Rotator cuff. I mean, that's where most patients end up having symptoms that don't get better with their own attempts or fail conservative treatment. So as I mentioned, the rotator cuff is that group of tendons. It goes top, front, and back of the shoulder. The rotator cuff's function is to initiate movement of the shoulder, but then as you're reaching, other muscles take over. The other very important function of the rotator cuff, if I'm holding something like this, it's keeping the ball centered on the socket. And it's a continuum. Obviously, on the good side of things, you have the normal tendon. And then there's inflammation, tendonitis. Another term you may hear is something called tendinosis if you're looking at your MRI report. All tendinosis means is that there's been on again, off again inflammation, and it's kind of changing the characteristics of the tendon. It doesn't mean it's necessarily gonna hurt, but it's just one of those continuums that's kind of in this area here. Well, eventually, the longer there's ongoing inflammation or injury, the tendon will eventually start to fail. So the next thing along the line of that continuum would be a partial tear. So as I tell patients, that's anywhere from one to 99% of the tendon is torn. Now that obviously they don't react the same, but that just means we're starting to see tearing. Eventually it may lead to a full tear or where the tendon itself or portions of the tendon are detached. So kind of as I describe a partial tear, rope brain, what percent thickness, because it matters and we'll talk about that. Full or complete tear means the tendon is detached. That doesn't mean all four tendons, but at least a portion of it. So what you're seeing here is an MRI image this is the ball and socket as if you're facing us. This is the muscle, there's the tendon, the white is fluid, and the red arrow is just pointing to where this individual has a tear. There's a separation. The fluid that was put in their shoulder joint leaks out through the tear. Obviously, not all tears are the same, and that's where the MRI becomes very valuable for me, trying to educate our patients as to treatment options. Hey, is this one tendon, is it two, is it three? You know, how far is that tendon retracted? Now, it's not as bad as those roller shades of old where if you didn't hold on to it, it shot up into the ceiling. But over time, because muscle keeps pulling on that tendon, it will gradually get bigger. But then the other downside of a tear that's been there for a long time, if the tendon is not connected and the muscle pulls on it but doesn't get a lot of resistance, what's going to happen? It's use it or lose it. That muscle starts to atrophy. So as we talk about the role of the MRI, as I'm trying to explain to a patient, A, what their problem is, but B, is this something that's repairable or not repairable? These factors are very important, and that's something we'll discuss. If you're a patient, I'll say, hey, these are the reasons we can or can't perform a certain procedure that we'll talk about in a moment. So what you're looking at here, this is a arthroscopic picture, the kind of the upper part here, that off-white, that's the rotator cuff tendon and it's detached from bone. So we're actually looking into the shoulder joint through the tendon, because normally that tendon should be covering the bone. So realize someone who has a rotator cuff tear, the same symptoms, it hurts, maybe there's some weakness, maybe there's some loss of motion, nighttime pain certainly can be very common, activity pain. It's amazing, you know, and you can't always judge the size of the tear 
by the symptoms because a lot of patients have other ways to compensate, but certainly pain with weakness is, is bringing that up, makes us more concerned. So how do we treat it? Well, it's similar, you know, it's kind of a common thing. You know, initial treatment, can we control inflammation? Can we address what might be causing the pain? Certainly that's in the face of what we call, you know, shall we say a low grade or medium grade partial tear. And there's not an absolute, is it 50%, is it 25%, is it 90%, but certainly if it's a tear that when we ultrasound or do an MRI, it's less than 50%, we see other inflammation, I think it's very reasonable to try conservative treatment first. Now, it's not 100% successful, but we may find through that combination of medicines, therapies, injections, that a symptomatic partial tear becomes asymptomatic. And if I can get someone asymptomatic, and I, I just remind them, if you have pain, come back and see me. I can't make them asymptomatic, I mean, I'm not gonna offer them an operation. Certainly in the face of a low-grade partial tear, I've done all the right things, pain continues, well, that's telling us that maybe more is going on and that might lead us to a surgery. Now, it's different if we're talking complete tears or what I would describe as a high-grade partial tear. You know, high-grade means we're definitely over 50%. We're probably getting into 75 or 80% of that thickness of tendon is torn. It doesn't mean we cannot try conservative treatment. And I'll be, I'll be honest with you, some insurance companies will insist that patient hasn't had six weeks of physical therapy, they have to go to physical therapy. Even though I've reported to them, they've got a full thickness tear and it's not gonna get better. It doesn't mean you can't see improvement. And certainly we have plenty, pa plenty of our patients that where they're at in their life, medically and otherwise, are just not good surgical candidates. It's not that we can't help them. We probably not, I tell them you're not gonna get your 20 year old shoulder, but we can give you a shoulder you can sleep at night with and you can at least do a lot of your daily activities with. But for me, this is the gold standard. Otherwise healthy, active, this is you know, debilitating, it's affecting my quality of life. We've identified a full thickness tear or certainly a, a high grade partial tear where it's hanging on by a thread, it's just a matter of time. I will offer them a surgery because the outcomes prove that patients will do better if you can put the tendon back where it's supposed to be. I mean, that's common sense, but it does, it does fit with how patients do. So how do we go about doing that? Now, this is an antiquated slide. I didn't realize as I was looking at it. This is like one of the original talks I gave and it, well, arthroscopic repair. Well, anyone in 2020 that has a rotator cuff tear, it's a 99.9% .9 chance it's all gonna be done through small incisions arthroscopically. That is not to say there aren't sometimes a little bigger incision is indicated. So up here on the top, this is the rotator cuff, this is the bone. What we need to do is figure out how to get this over here and secure it. So the issue on this is we use devices called suture anchors. And this is an old diagram, you know, it's a metal anchor. We don't, you know, we rarely use metal anymore. There's these neat materials now that are composites that heal the bone and resorb over time. But an anchor is an anchor. It's something that we fix the bone. We take those stitches from that anchor and there's various configurations and how we can do it. We pass it through the tendon and by bringing that back down, we reattach the tendon to bone. So we do a direct repair. What you're seeing here, and it shows up a little bit if you can see the little red dots. What we wanna do is we wanna scuff up or roughen up the bone because the key to healing is blood supply. We want that bloody, you know, bloody, sorry. We want the blood flow from the bone to help the tendon to heal because a healed tendon obviously will do better than a non-healed tendon. So this is just kind of a sequence starting on the upper left. So this is the picture of the rotator cuff tear here. This is the bone as we're starting to prepare it. Just to the right here, this is after stitches have been placed and this is the device we use through those cannulas so we can monitor. You know, I take pictures kind of in the middle of the repair more so, to, so a patient understands there's stitches running all, how do you keep it all organized? We do it through these cannulas. So this is a before and this is an after. So what we've done, we've passed those stitches through. We can tie these different knots. And by pulling things down, and this is just a more straight on view, we've closed that down. So at time zero, you know, I hand these patients these pictures after surgery, there's your repair. We put it back together. I'm sitting there patting myself on the back because it's fun to do. It's one of the things I enjoy to do a lot. Well, there are some times where the tear is so big, we can't get a direct repair. But the patient's young, health, physio physiologically, the joint has good cartilage. Boy, you know, what are we gonna do? Because this was a quandary. We didn't know what to do. There were some exotic big surgeries, transfer muscles, transfer tendons, just to try to provide pain relief, but we weren't really doing well. Patients weren't satisfied. So about 15 years ago, there was a surgeon in Japan who was facing this problem, and he, along with some of his engineers, started thinking about it, and they came up with a procedure, and this is the Americanized version of it, to say, well, what, you know, why would the shoulder do poorly if they don't have a rotator cuff? And I mentioned the main function of the rotator cuff is to keep the ball centered on the socket so other muscles can do the work for you. 
Well, if you've torn the upper part of your rotator cuff, instead of the ball rotating, it pistons up and down. So if there is a way for us to get that ball centered over the socket, thus allowing the other <laughs> muscles to, to work, we may be able to relieve pain and improve function even though we can't directly repair the rotator cuff. So the most critical part of that is this top part of the shoulder. We call it the superior shoulder. And so there's the rotator cuff, but there's also the capsule. So this is a procedure called the superior capsule reconstruction or SCR. I've been doing it now for about four years. Like, you know, as I say, it's been around for almost 15 going on 20. And really what we're doing, we're talking about tears of this upper part of the rotator cuff. So the patient can't raise their arm or if they do, it hurts all the time. Yet the front and the back works pretty well, so down here they're not bad, but they're obviously dysfunctional because of pain or weakness. And this little illustration down here, and I'll have some more in a moment. You know, for us to consider this, once again, you have to have good cartilage, you have to have good muscle otherwise. There has to be at least tendon in front and back, and if, we can, if that's the case, we can do this surgery. And essentially what we're doing is we're creating a patch between the bones so that when you raise and lower the arm, that ball will rotate in that piston. It keeps the ball centered over the socket. It allows the muscles that are there, including your deltoid, which is a good muscle, to power the shoulder. How do we do that? Well, what we're using is a tissue called an allograft. Allograft means we're getting it from someone else. It's actually an allograft of skin or dermis. So it comes from a, you know, a donor source. It's not like a heart or liver or, or lung transplant. It doesn't have that kind of reaction with the body. And essentially what we're doing is we're, we're attaching it from the ball to the socket. So this is a picture of it just in an illustration. But this is a picture as we're doing the surgery and we're working on passing stitches to pass all this. And this is done arthroscopically through small incisions. What you're seeing is this on the left, this is that patient, there's the ball, there's the rotator cuff way over here, and it's so scarred down, torn and retracted, you can't pull that back over. You know, we never had a good solution for that. Well, this would be an after picture. We can see this patch, it's going from the ball and you can't see in the distance, it's attached to the socket, but it's filled in that gap and then we repair the other tendons around it. But this is what it would look like arthroscopically when we're done. So, you know, what are the outcomes? I mean, what are we seeing? You know, we, had a, we would go from a problem that we really had, I won't say 0% chance of really helping, but probably limited help, to at least 80% of patients see a reduction in pain and improvement in function. No, it is not a 20-year-old shoulder, but the power of this is when I have someone come in the office and they can't raise it, they can lift it, but they can't raise it. And when they leave my office, when they're all said and done, now, you don't have the same strength up here as you would if it was a normal rotator cuff, but I have people back in all walks of life doing things. And if nothing else, if you're in your 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, what's our option if we can't do that? Either live with it or some major surgery that has a, a lesser outcome, or lastly, a joint replacement. That's not something we wanna do early in life if we can avoid it. So as I say, the big thing about it, it preserves the joint. We don't burn any bridges. If 10 years, 15 years down the road, over time the joint starts to deteriorate, we always have the option for something like a joint replacement. And this is what its diagram is. This is that patch attached. This would be a picture where the muscles come in. So once again, it's for patients that still have good joint cartilage. Unfortunately, they failed conservative treatment due to a, due to a very large rotator cuff tear, and we realize it's just not repairable. Or the neat thing is, we can get it part of the way back, we can't get it all the way back. That way we can put that patch in, we bring it back over, and sometimes we can do a little bit of a repair on top of it. It provides patients with pain relief and restoration and function. And realize for those of that condition that have been told, hey, there's nothing we can do, well, maybe we can. It's not for everybody, but it's a procedure we do here locally. So what's the recovery? Because this is the rub. I tell patients, don't sign up for the surgery if you can't sign up for the recovery. Because I mentioned the two most important times are what I do for that hour and a half to two hours in surgery. I'm on the hook to make sure I do everything right, but I know the biggest burden is when I tell a patient I'm taking that arm away from you for six or eight weeks. And it's four to six months before you'll have full function back and you gotta behave all that time. I mean, I, excuse me, I get it, but you know, that's kind of the mindset. Because once we repair it, time zero, you're rolling a recovery room, the only thing holding that thing together are all those beautiful little stitches waiting for the bone to heal. And that's why we need that six to eight week window to protect that tendon. Why six versus eight? It all depends on tear size. You know, bigger area needs longer to heal. You know, patient age, over 60 versus under 60, and that's just biology, we have to be a little more cautious so that we, you know, at the end of the day, the most successful patients, my repair heal. It healed, they're gonna be fine. It doesn't heal, then we're kind of dicey with how things go. Typically, somewhere during that six or eight period, week period of time, a therapist will be involved, but they'll do the movement for you. We call that passive motion. Because as soon as you're moving your arm, it's like pulling on the seam of my jacket here, you can pull that all apart. 
Now, once we get out, you know, we get out that six or eight weeks, now the sling goes away, we start moving it, but realize it's a gradual progression. It's not like you take the sling on off and away you go. It takes time, and as I mentioned, for small tears, you know, centimeter or two, medium tears, maybe up to two to three centimeters, you know, I always warn patients it could be a four to six month window of time, day of surgery, 90%, 90% recovery. Now these large tears, but yet we can still repair them, or that procedure I mentioned called the superior capsular re reconstruction, those are patients that it's probably at least six months, maybe out to nine, depending on if we do a big tendon repair, it takes a while for that muscle to regenerate, or this superior capsule repair just takes time. But just realize, it's not that you're in the sling that long, but you're gonna see improvement out to that point. That certainly has a bearing if you're a, a manual labor type person, how long am I off work, those type of things, or what, whatever your recreation is, we need to give it the time to heal. So that's the tough part about rotator cuff surgery. It takes a while to heal, but once it heals, people do very well. Let me get a couple more in before we'll kind of conclude today. There's a condition called a frozen shoulder. Frozen shoulder just means the joint won't move, it hurts, okay? Most times, people don't remember doing anything, but it can come after an injury or trauma. And essentially what's happening is that it's the lining of the joint that's getting inflamed. Those that are diabetics, and you can add this to the list of all those things, great, as a diabetic, I'm at a greater risk for it. You know, it just happens to run higher in diabetics where, you know, one day they come in and they say, you know what, I don't know what I did for the last couple of months, I'm having more pain, I, I just can't move it. Well, it's just one of those conditions that can be associated with diabetes. Essentially, it's the lining of the joint, so this is supposed to represent a healthy lining and a contracted lining, but the lining gets thicker and thicker and it hurts. So there's these stages, the freezing stage. Think about it like having a sunburn and you start twisting your skin. That's not very comfortable. Think about it if it's a bad enough burn, how tight that starts to feel. So that's the freezing phase. Well, then it's frozen, it's stuck, but a lot of times at that point it hurts less. Yeah, it's not great function, but it, it doesn't hurt. Eventually, you know, all the studies say it'll thaw, but you know, thawing could take years, it may never come back again. Most patients aren't satisfied waiting an 18 month to two year period of time to see if they'll get some of their shoulder motion back. So what's the treatment? Well, the good news, once we identify it, because it can mimic other things, it hurts. Like, well, is this really a frozen shoulder? Is this a rotator cuff problem? Obviously, we have to define what it is, but if we identify it as a frozen shoulder, and we can control inflammation, medicines, of course, maybe injections. This is just a picture, I use the term arthrogram. There's a picture of a radiologist injecting into a joint. If we can reduce the inflammation, now we're able to start working with therapies and things to start stretching, the good news, probably at least 80 to 85% of patients, now it takes a few months, but at least, hey, motion's coming back, pain's going away, we can address it without having to operate. That being said, there are some patients, either it's been going on long enough, or they've tried a course of therapy, it's just not moving, well, we can help them out. Now, this isn't something we do with the patient awake, but we can actually, what we call, manipulate the shoulder. And this is one of those things, when I do it, a lot of people in the room kind of, kind of cringe a little bit, Patient's asleep, doesn't feel or remember anything, and I just move their arm. And what it is, it's pop, 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 and all of a sudden, hey, we've done what they could not do in therapy, which is to break up the scar tissue. So this is what a normal capsule looks like, this off-white color. That's what it looks like if you have a frozen shoulder. It's that hot, red, inflamed tissue. The good news, either through conservative treatment or if we do need to take a patient to surgery, the vast majority have near complete, not saying all motion back, but pretty close and good function, so it's a correctable condition. Now the final topic I'm going to zone in on because it's something that we at our office you know, do and, and are finding we're doing more and more of is treatment for shoulder osteoarthritis. So the most common you know, form of osteoarthritis is your knees, then your hips, probably your back because those are weight-bearing joints. We stand, we walk, we climb, we squat, we kneel. That being said, the shoulder joint, because it has cartilage, is also susceptible to osteoarthritis. Because it's not a weight-bearing joint per se, now that, that's different in a manual labor, someone who does weight training and things like that. Since it's not a weight-bearing joint, it's more better tolerated. Hey, they can get by with medicines, injections more easily than someone who would be walking on their legs or standing on their legs. You know, therapy can help. And what this, oops, what this x-ray is showing us, there's the ball and socket, but the gap or space is nearly gone. So that's how we can tell there's osteoarthritis. There's little bone spurs. Bone spur just means because the cartilage is not there to protect the bone, the bone makes more bone. So this can manifest as stiffness, pain, mechanical symptoms, you know, all the above. Well, obviously there's a subset of patients that because of their osteoarthritis of their shoulder, have tried conservative treatment. Usually what's happening is that motion, not the pain, the pain is part of it, but it, it becomes so limited, they just can't function and understandable. It's, you know, they can't really get to the top of their head and the joint is so arthritic, no one wants to live like that. 
So then we have the role of shoulder replacement. And just to understand the concept, there are two types of shoulder replacement, and that's what I want to kind of close up with here. So the shoulder is a ball and socket. And I've kind of mentioned that numerous times today. You have a rotator cuff, tendon, complex, and muscles to power that shoulder. So in the face of someone with osteoarthritis, fails conservative treatment, but they still have a good rotator cuff and good muscles around it, then we do what we call an anatomic shoulder replacement. So anatomic simply means where there's a ball, we put a ball, and where there's a socket, we put a socket. Because the rotator cuff will move the shoulder and make the shoulder function. So what you're seeing here down the lower left, that's just an example or a picture of what one of these replacements look like. That's the ball portion of it. And then the socket, there's plastic, there's metal, but that's just an example of the socket. And then up here is just an x-ray after surgery. It's not the same patient, but at least right now that space is restored because that's plastic. We have a metal ball, but you know, the reason we know the rotator cuff is intact because that space between the two here is fine because we know the rotator cuff will power the shoulder. What happens if you have osteoarthritis and you're that patient that has a big rotator cuff tear that's not repairable or because it's been so long that you've had osteoarthritis, the rotator cuff muscles have atrophied beyond hope. Now what do we do, okay? So this is the other type of shoulder replacement is called a reverse shoulder replacement. So we're getting in the muddy waters here, but understand the rotator cuff moves the shoulder, okay? Without a rotator cuff, now you have to rely on other muscles, but the problem is if, that's, if you put a ball and socket in the shoulder without a rotator cuff, all it's gonna do is this, it's not gonna rotate. So this design came in probably you know, almost 25, 30 years old out of Europe. And once again, you know, physicians and uh, biomechanical engineers that really put some thought into this and they said, well, wait a minute. If there's some way that we can keep that ball and socket centered, even without a rotator cuff, we can get other muscle groups to help patients elevate the arm and use their arm. And so this concept of the reverse is, well, where the ball normally is, now you have a socket, and where the socket normally is, you have a ball. And what it's doing, it's essentially, it's capturing, so it can't shift up and down. We've adjusted some of the position of where it sits, but now other muscles can help raise and lower that arm, where before, once again, they were pretty much crippled, they couldn't use it. It's always the last option on the road, hey, you know, we want to repair rotator cuffs, we want to preserve the joint, we'll do a replacement, which is anatomic, if all else fails, this is the salvage operation you know, for many, but it's also the first operation for someone that has a bad rotator cuff and, and end-stage osteoarthritis. You know, as I say, it's all about biomechanics, and it's kind of a neat and very powerful operation. Now, every year I'm at meetings, every year I'm listening. You know, when I first started doing this surgery over 10 years ago, we saved it for just the, you know, they had to be low demand, they had to this and that. Well, there's been a lot of evolution in the designs, and it's amazing now as I talk to people that are exclusive shoulder arthroplasty surgeons, the indications as far as well, I didn't really want to, you know, that rotator cuff didn't look good, I'm doing a reverse, you know, versus it used to be trashed, or that patient's 55, I'm doing a reverse, where we never would have thought of that. And I'm not saying we advocate, we do this willy-nilly, but it's still a very powerful operation. Let's say I mentioned that term, superior capsular reconstruction, SCR. What if they're 55 with an ir in, you know, irreparable rotator cuff and they're already arthritic? There's nothing we used to have for that, whereas some of these newer designs that have a, a greater durability can once again, it's not a normal shoulder, but it gives them back a high quality of life. And so it's kind of a workhorse that's becoming more and more utilized by those of us who do shoulder replacement. What's the recovery? It's kind of like a rotator cuff surgery. The first six weeks, we got a baby, we got to protect it. After six weeks, we progress. And it's about a six to nine month recovery to say you're 90% you're recovered. So it's kind of comparable if someone went through a rotator cuff. So I think that ends the, the whirlwind tour, and no one's raised a hand, no one's asked a question. That doesn't mean there aren't any out there. So if there are things, I know I, I you know, kind of go over a broad stroke here, but if there's anything I could come back and questions I could answer or things I could go over again, please. You showed that, I uh, talked about that osteoarthritis in your shoulder. Mm -hmm. Does rheumatoid arthritis also describe it? So exactly, so arthritis means joint inflammation. Osteoarthritis specifically is the gradual wearing out of our cartilage, we all are susceptible. Then you talk about rheumatoid arthritis, which is one of a family of what we call inflammatory arthritis. So that's just one type, but you're right. Because of the joint inflammation, the body's own immune system, that too can damage a joint. So that may be another reason that we're talking about a shoulder replacement, hip replacement, knee replacement, is if they have an inflammatory arthritis, it's damaging that joint. You know, it's causing more you know, damage. We can replace it to resolve that problem. Other questions or things I could clarify, please. Um, most insurances, like under Medicare, cover any of 
Absolutely. I mean, like anything else with all these procedures, we need a diagnosis well documented. You know, there's some form for, you know, a role for appropriate conservative treatment, but certainly with all these diagnoses and, and, you know, appropriate, you know, the vast majority are covered under most insurance plans, including Medicare for these things. Yes. So, I mean, interesting enough, you know, the burst itself is a fluid fill sac that if it gets inflamed, and let's say we have to get in there and clean it out, it forms again. Then, It'll reform. You know, so it's not something where you have to replace or do something like that. Anywhere in two, you know, once that's, those surfaces start moving again, it forms back. But after that surgery, we want it to be back to a normal, kind of a nice open space, all surfaces smooth type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. I had both ear plugs surgery about four and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. And it didn't turn out because the surgery was going normally. The rotator cuff was torn this way. Sure. Mine was also shredded mm -hmm. this way. Mm -hmm. Is there any type of repair that could be done? So, I mean, obviously, you know, I've, I've shown some pictures here that were kind of the most straightforward tendon torn from bone. That's not how they always are. As I've told others, when we go in to do rotator cuff surgery, and particularly these big, more complex tears, mm -hmm. it's doing a jigsaw puzzle without the cover. You gotta figure it out. And sometimes it's directly repair to bone, but sometimes we repair tendon to tendon. The problem with those where you're repairing tendon to tendon, you know, the blood flow is not as good. That's always frustrating. So even though you may do a beautiful repair, the patient does everything they've asked, those are the ones that are tricky. So let's say now you're out several years, you're still having problems. Some of it is knowing what really is going on now. Did it just never heal? Is it the whole thing? Is it partial? You know, as I said, depends on the quality of the joint. You know, so this whole concept, let's say someone's had a previous repair, despite best efforts on all parties, it didn't go well, it didn't heal, or it's retorn, you know, and they, but they still have a good joint, they failed conservative treatment, that procedure called the superior capsular reconstruction is a game changer. For those patients that remain debilitated and dissatisfied, but still have a good joint, that's the kind of patient that we'd consider that on. We're not gonna go back and do the same operation twice if it didn't work the first time, but now having that as a tool, we may be able to do that procedure, but there's still tendon around that we can use. We may be able to still tie that in. So call it a partial repair, but by putting that, putting that graft in, it now protects it and you, you know, pa patients have a much better outcome versus having to live with pain or leading to an arthritic shoulder that only, the only option is a replacement. It all depends, it all depends. You know, smaller tears, caught early, the majority can be back without any restrictions provided, hey, stick to those exercises. <laughs> I use the term professional athlete for my laborers that we do shoulder, knee, and operations. You know, and they're looking at me like, what do you mean by that? I say, you do a manual job, you get paid a salary for it. Now it's not what the Packers and the Bucks and the, and the Brewers are making, but if we fix a problem and then we identify things that you can do to stay in shape to prevent it from being hurt again, that goes a long way. Now. If somebody has a much bigger problem, a more chronic problem, and we can go in there and make them better, but it's a very large tear or muscle atrophy, we may never be able to get them back all the way to that level. So there may be a role at some point for some permanent restrictions. Hey, we limit more of the lifting way up high or some things that might put the shoulder at risk. Yes? Hey, two, two part question for you. When you're doing these, uh, like bicep tenon, tenonesis. Yes, thing, yeah. Uh, I've had four shoulder operations, two on each shoulder. Reattachments done. Mm -hmm. Is there much evidence to suggest that because you're shifting things that now things aren't moving quite as naturally, so it accelerates degeneration at all in the shoulders? Because I'm suspicious that's what happened to me now because I've got such bad osteoarthritis in both shoulders, sure. and especially it's in Green Bay, so there's not a lot to do at my age, yep. the short of 50. No. Nope. But, but shoulder replacements, and now I'm in that limbo stage waiting till. I'm old enough that they want to do that, yeah. and, and I don't know how to manage this pain. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, obviously a broad question. So simply, can trauma or injury to your shoulder in some way, shape, or form, leading to surgeries, you know, accelerate maybe what's a pre-existing condition? Hey, everybody's different. You know, arthritis runs in the family and otherwise. So the simple answer is yes. When we do our darndest when we're doing surgery to try to recreate as normal an environment as possible, it's probably more rotator. The biceps has less of a role in that, but the rotator cuff does. If we can repair it and it functions, so once again, it's more of a, it stays on the, on the ball and socket versus does some more of that slip shifting or sliding that can reduce, but it doesn't prevent it from coming. I didn't get into the weeds because that's into the weeds talk when we talk about osteoarthritis and we talk about somebody who's, you know, 40s maybe. 
you know, that's not a procedure here, but I have some colleagues I know out there that are doing some staging procedures between, hey, I got to commit to a full joint replacement. Is there anything else I could do where there can be partial replacements, there can be some grafting that can be done. It's not the permanent solution, but if it can bridge the gap from 40s to 60s, there's some other operations. I didn't include that because I think that's getting a little too esoteric, but there are some other options. It just may take someone that's exclusively a shoulder specialist and really works with the patient population that might be in that age that really falls between the cracks between and we can do a soft tissue surgery and now we got to do a replacement. Because once the replacement is in, granted they're durable, but we can't guarantee someone of in their 40s, this is going to last you another 40 years. Other questions? Yes. So, I mean, age, obviously age, just because our quality of tissue, our healing capabilities. No gender, I wouldn't, I don't know of that association. You know, at the end of the day, it still comes down to, when I talk to patients about rotator cuff tears, and obviously the older we get, we have other medical factors involved, so we always gotta understand, is it, if it, we're gonna consider an operation, do the benefits outweigh the risks? So if someone has a symptomatic tear, appropriate conservative treatment has been rendered, the problem is affecting quality of life. Okay, we take a step back, you know, what's the size of the tear, is it realistic or not? Are they otherwise a healthy person, medical conditions well controlled? It's not that the, I mean, I think 50-50 is a little low, but I wouldn't guarantee you a 90% outcome, but I would still put you in that probably 80% good, good or excellent results. If I do my job right, you rehab it right, we do a good repair with the different techniques we have available to enhance. Once again, I didn't get into this into the talk, but nowadays, kind of the big buzz is about biologics. So people have heard of stem cells, they've heard of other things. I mean, all this is just trying to understand how can we help our bodies heal? And so whether you're talking shoulder, hip, or knee, we're applying some of these things, whether it's injections, whether it's other materials. I have a patient that has a very thin rotator cuff. We can augment or patch to kind of make it thicker, different than the SCR. So there's other things that we can bring to a surgery, whether because of just the nature of the, tr of the problem, or maybe we're talking about someone who happens to be a little older and we just realize the biology in that patient's not as good as the biology of my 20 year old. It doesn't mean we can't still offer them help, if you follow what I'm saying. Go ahead. What if you had your shoulder pop up twice, reset, and then the last time you injured it, it was an AC tear, and now you have numbness all the way down your arm? Well, I mean, that's a complex thing. I mean, obviously, you know, and that's a, just talking about symptoms, and we're talking about a patient with symptoms. You know, it's not uncommon if someone will have a shoulder problem and can have arm numbness, you know, and, and the nerves that come from the neck travel through the shoulder and end up down the arm. Now, if someone's had multiple injuries and trauma, it could certainly be shoulder, but if I'm working up that patient, we're gonna see what the shoulder problem is, but there are some tests to make sure, are we dealing with a, a nerve issue related to the shoulder? It could be something else entirely, uh, but certainly someone in the face of recurrent, that shoulder comes in, comes out, that's that labral discussion. You worry about what damage has been done because of the injury. We also start worrying what's happening to that joint cartilage is it wearing out over time. Anything else? Any other questions? Go ahead, we'll start here. <laughs> uh, partial tear, can your person live with that? I mean, uh, Absolutely. If I did an MRI of everybody in the shoulder, uh, or in the room of their shoulder, including mine, which I do not want to see, I'll guarantee you we'll find some partial tear, okay? It, it's analogous to like someone has a meniscus tear, which is a cartilage in your knee. There's a lot of people that live with it and don't even have problems. So, why do some become symptomatic, some don't, we don't always know. And you know, we get to see only the, the, the tip of the iceberg, the ones that have pain and come and see us. But you know, depending on probably location of the tear, activity level, you know, pain is our guide. If it hurts and we know it's there, then we realize it's probably getting worse. Yeah, I had a partial tear, yeah. I can diagnose a partial tear, mm -hmm. MRI. Yeah. And the pain has gotten better, I mean, I've been doing exercises and yep. things like that. So it means I'm kind of like a right. So you heard that first part of my talk on partial tears, particularly if we're not looking at something hanging on by a thread. I mean, if it's hanging by a thread, it's just a matter of time. Because think about it, if the, if the rest of the tendon is trying to make up for 50, 75, 80% of a torn tendon, it's eventually gonna fail. But if it's one of those smaller partial tears, a lot of those are incidental findings. And, and it might be something else altogether. Maybe it's the bursa that was inflamed in the first place. So, so, pain, yeah. it's, it's better than what it was. So, hey, stick to the conservative approach. Do your exercises if that's what you've done. As long as pain is getting better going away, you're fine. If it ever starts to spike again, despite those efforts, it's worth going in and having it reassessed. Yeah. I think there's some in there. Go ahead. What muscles in the upper part of the arm actually control and rotate the lower part of your body? 
Well, it's a mixture of both. Okay, so what is specifically? You want to turn your hand up and down? Is that what you're concerned about, or what? Well, say a person had a major shoulder injury, like hmm. surgery, mm -hmm. and how they can't like rotate their arm out to get it like, straight. So to rotate your arm like this, yeah. it's your rotator cuff. It's some of the muscles up in the shoulder. Depending on the severity of the injury, you know, scarring and stiffness and tightness, that would affect rotation up here in the shoulder or elevation, possibly. Anyone else? Yeah, please. I have I'll come back. both shoulders are slack too. They yeah. Here. yeah. And the doctor said, it seems that no, you can do, it's not that bad, you can do whatever you want. But I do a lot of gardening. Mm -hmm. So I'm you know, emptying out mm -hmm. the grass pickers from carrying those. Right. Um, um, Rototilling, mm -hmm. carrying pots. Are those activities would cause pain with that or? So let me educate the audience, a slap tear. So I mentioned the term labrum before, and when we talk about the sock at the top of the socket, we refer to as the superior portion of it. So when, when the labrum tears at the top, there's an acronym, superior labral tear, anterior posterior to the biceps. So that's a slap two tear. Now understand, you know, that's where the biceps originated or attaches, depends on what you're doing. So more activities where you're in this area, you're probably not gonna notice as much. When you start getting away from the body or overhead, if somebody has those, type of activity, certainly a throwing athlete, overhead athlete, you're gonna be more symptomatic. So if you're talking about you're doing things here, you're kind of being smart, hey, I was told to be, if I could do it, do it more chest level down than chest level up, pain's your guide. If you're not hurting, you're not doing any harm to yourself. Understand that. It's usually, I think I was doing all those activities, but then it would be later when I was mm -hmm. in bed sleeping, yep. that's when it really yep. hurt. Well, and this is an example, you know, this you know, didn't come on because you, you, know, you slipped and fell on the ice maybe. It's do all the other stuff. If someone's got you on that right program for all the exercises and you're doing that, but yet, despite that, I'm having more pain, it's still making sure is that truly the source of pain or not. It could still be a bursitis, it could be something else. If someone fails conservative treatment, and we're talking about that labral tear, that's where I do that biceps tenotomy. I release the biceps, it can't pull the labrum off anymore, I reattach the biceps. Usually what we do with the labrum, we just smooth it out, we do not have to repair it, because that'll solve your problem. So there is a solution, but I would say in that setting, you wanna do all this stuff appropriately to make sure the muscles around the shoulder are strong, and then really decide, how much does it bother me? Hey, it's keeping me awake, I can't do something. Make, make sure that's the source of the pain, there are some solutions though for it. And a lot of folks talk about the stem cell, um, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the bottom line is this, stem cells and what a stem cell is, very simply, everybody, it's a cell that doesn't know yet what it wants to be, okay? Will it be skin, muscle, or bone? Stem cells can be obtained from us, they can be obtained from other sources, but what a stem cell is doing, because we don't have full control by any means, a stem cell when injected, whether it's tissue, joints, it's really modulating and managing inflammation. So will it be eventually approved by the FDA? There are ongoing trials in all areas on it, okay? But most of this is not FDA approved, so it's pricey, depends on the clinic. Where it's probably gonna be approved first is in the knee for, for osteoarthritis, where it's gonna be a, along with cortisone and other things, you can use it in the knee. As we inject it, and it's not that you can have, can't have these injections and there's benefit to it, just realize it's not gonna bring back cartilage that's gone. It may help a tendon that's inflamed heal, or we may use it when we're doing a repair, we'll inject stem cells or something around it to enhance the repair. So that's kind of its role, but it just, hey, if you have a slap tear, we put cortisone, or, or excuse me, put stem cells in your shoulder, you might feel better for a while, but it's not healing it or turning it into a, a, a new cartilage. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Any other questions? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yes, thank you. I tore my rotator cuff last July, mm -hmm. and I did have the MRI. It's a total tear. I got a push out surgery till after January of next year. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, understand this. I mean, things are gonna be changing. It's not gonna be the same shoulder then that it is now. Could the tear get a little bigger? Possibly, not maybe drastically if you don't injure yourself. Will the muscle atrophy a little bit more? Yes, it will. Will the quality of the tendon change? So a normal tendon is like supple leather, nice supple leather. When it's torn after a while, it becomes a little more stiff. So that doesn't mean it's not repairable potentially, but it will change some of the characteristics. You know, if I have patients and I, hey, I, tell, I told you, don't sign up for the surgery if you can't sign up for the recovery. And there's many reasons. I just can't do this now, doc. That's fine. 
Now that I have the ability and I've had that ability to do the SCR, that procedure, at least then if I know I have a patient with a large tear and just due to circumstances they're not a candidate where I thought, hey, I could probably repair it, that's always in the back. I always tell patients, hey, we'll try to repair it first. If we can, we great. If not, I'll do the SCR at the same time. So I still know I have an operation to give them as close to as, you know, probably as comparable an outcome, whether I could do it right when we knew it was torn or maybe delayed just because of health or other factors. Okay. Yep. Anything else? Well, thank you for your attention. I appreciate you coming and hopefully you've learned something and let us know if we can help you in the future.